Failed Intervention Britain in the Transcaucuses, 1918-20 to A 44-minute presentation sponsored by the Defence Studies Department held at the Collingwood Room in the Joint Services Command Staff College, Shrivenham on the 22nd of March 2006. The speaker is Dr Alex Marshall, who is a member of the Central Eurasian Studies Society and lectures in Defence Studies at JSCSC. This presentation covers why British intervention in this region failed and the role and attitudes of key political and military personnel. Please note that there are some references to the visual aids that were used during the presentation. Dr Alex Marshall. This started out as an intended talk which was really intended to be a kind of progress report on a book I'm writing at the moment. Uh, the book I'm writing is a book on the Soviet effect on the Caucasus between about 1905 uh, and uh, 1989. Um, so the book itself is about, is about the Soviet Caucasus and this is part of one chapter on the Russian Civil War period uh, in the Caucasus and the various forces that were involved. Part of the intention behind the book uh, was to bring together in one place sources which had previously existed in different compartments or different books even, volumes of historiography, in the sense that the ambition, uh, whether it's achieved or not, is yet to see, but the ambition was to bring together the Russian, the English, and potentially as well, if I can get my head around the language, the Turkish historiography on this subject. Now, the Transcaucasus and the Caucasus in general is a region that's obviously rapidly going up towards the top of the tree in terms of international interest in that area. One thing that complicates the issue as a whole is the geography of the subject. I appreciate this is probably going to be, for some, like teaching your grannies to suck eggs, but this is the Caucasus, and basically it's a very complicated place. This in particular is the Tsarist Caucasus before 1917. And in the conquest of the Caucasus, from the beginning of the 19th century onwards, the Tsarist regime had set up uh, various proto-national states. One of the main tools of conquest was the Cossack, the three Cossack hosts. And the hosts we're talking of here are the Kuban Cossack host, which occupied the Black Sea district, the Terek Cossack host, which occupied the Terek Oblast here, and further to the north you've got the Don Cossacks, and they played a large role in the sort of Tsar's conquest of the region in general. But you've got a region in general that ethnographically is very complicated. Dagestan, you've got a different language practically in every village, in every valley. You've also got an area where religion is a source of conflict. What was notable about the Caucasus is that the majority of it was relatively recently Islamicized when the Russians came along. Dagestan, you're talking about Islam having had a presence there since the 8th century. But if you look further to the north, to the Ossetians, the Ingush and the Chechens, who are all in this kind of region here, they had only begun to be Islamicized in the 18th century. The last Ingush were converted to Islam from paganism in 1863. So you had the combination of very recent Islamization, creating a sort of very vibrant belief in Islam, just as you always have with relatively recent converts, with Russian attempts to colonize the region themselves and to carry out conversion campaigns. One of the success stories of the Russian efforts was the Ossetians, approximately half of whom became Russian Orthodox, the other half of whom remained Muslims. Then in the Transcaucasus, you've got, again, a very complicated region. Uh, Georgia, which was a number of separate kingdoms until the Russians came along and started to unify them once more. The Armenians, who occupied a huge diaspora, not only in Armenia today, but in much of uh, modern-day Turkey. And Azerbaijan, again, where you had a very weakly formulated sense of nationalism before 1917, and where you had, again, a diaspora situation with Azeris living both in northern Iran uh, and in what later became Azerbaijan. So it's a complicated region in general, and it remains a very complicated region today. But looking at the sort of critical issues that the British themselves inherited, if you like, in 1917 to 1920, when they became involved in the regions themselves, there was a certain amount of legacy that they had to deal with. The first was, obviously, the Tsarist policies in the region, which, as I say, were policies of forced colonization in many instances. During the 1860s, you had a period of time referred to amongst Muslims as the Mahajirsa, where you had literally thousands of Muslims emigrating. Once the conquest of the Caucasus was complete, 
combination of Ottoman propaganda with Tsar's military pressure led many Muslims living in the North Caucasus region in particular to decide that they didn't want to be in that neighborhood anymore and they migrated to the Ottoman Empire. And you saw remnants of this well into the 20th century, for example, with the Circassian bodyguard of the Royal House of Jordan. You had these people looking like Cossacks in the middle of Jordan. How did they get there? Well, they are descendants of the people who had left in the 1860s. So massive migration, at least 400,000 Circassians leaving, perhaps over a million people leaving that region as a whole in the wake of the Tsarist conquest. And the people pouring in to take over that land were primarily, initially at least, the Terek and Kuban Cossack hosts. Land obviously was very cheap, agriculture was very cheap, cows were very cheap to buy. So you had massive migration in the 1860s and 1870s which created ethnic problems later on. By the beginning of 1865, you had barely 100,000 Aidaigi Circassians remaining in the Kuban region, the region they originally came from, compared to 220,000 Cossacks. So the Cossacks were pushing out the mountaineers in lots of ways. The Russians were obviously criticised for this in the contemporary European press of the day, particularly by the British, but they had a nice habit of pointing out that they were doing no more than the British themselves had done to Scottish Highlanders in the 18th century. Secondly, something that obviously would strike us as very significant today is that you had competition over land use and over new oil discoveries. Land use, very briefly, was biased within the region. The Cossack hosts had a priority and a privileged position in regard to land. Terek Cossack hosts, for example, occupied 60% of the land in the Terek region. Each individual Cossack had between about 33 and 42 acres of soil. Compared to your mountaineer, your Chechen or your Dagestani, who had about 16 acres of land which you could grow things on. So you had deep inequality in terms of land use in the region. A marginal agricultural economy as well, combined with the discovery of oil in the 1880s and 1890s. One of the two main regions of oil production was Grozny, which is a name now known to nearly everybody, I think, who looks at the Caucasus in the present day. This is from the 1890s, an oil gusher. The discovery of oil, to a certain degree, radically changed the economic position of the region. Between 1896 and 1907, the number of oil wells in the Terracol blast rose from just 8 to 265. By the 1890s, Tsarist Empire was the largest oil-producing region in the world. But you had oil production discovered not only in what is modern-day Chechnya, but in Baku and the Azeri coast as well. In Baku was transformed overnight from a sort of small coastal town into a thriving port town exporting vast amounts of oil and petroleum products. Now, moving on to the Civil War period, it doesn't get any less complicated. The way I've analysed it in the book is I've tried to separate it out to make it easier for the reader into three complex event zones, and that's basically, I think, the best way of seeing it. During the Civil War, which begins towards the end of 1917 and unfolds more fully in 1918, you have three things going on in the Caucasus. In the north, you have Russian-led, Russian-dominated whites, the white movement opposing the Bolshevik regime, initially under Konilov and Alexeyev, and then from 1918 onwards under Denikin. They are operating in the Kuban region, relying upon the Kuban Cossacks to provide them with their manpower. The Terek Dagestan region, you've got a very complicated situation in which local indigenous intelligentsia are trying to create their own form of government. At the end of 1917, you've got the rise of the Terek Dagestan government, or Terdag as I've called it here, as well as the Union of Mountaineers, which emerges in March 1917 and begins to take full form towards the end of 1917, and increasing ethnic clashes between Cossacks and mountaineers. The mountaineers, of course, regard the revolution in general as a way to take land off the Cossacks. Then, finally, in the third event zone in the south, the Transcaucasus, you have a collapse of morale, the collapse of the army, the Russian army fighting the Ottoman Empire in the south, and the advance from 1918 onwards of Ottoman troops gradually through Georgia, circumventing Armenia and slowly towards Baku. And this itself also had dramatic effects within the region as a whole, because as the Russian army collapsed, the arms that they had possessed filtered back into the region as a whole. So if you wanted to get your hands on rifles, machine guns, artillery, shells, small arms ammunition, in this period of time, it wasn't particularly a problem. The Caucasus region as a whole became flooded with military technology, and it wasn't until 1925 when the Soviets themselves mounted a comprehensive disarmament campaign in the region that this sort of problem was eventually solved.
Now, what is it exactly that the British themselves are trying to do? I think that's a very good question, in part because it helps explain why things don't work out for them. Now, I'm trying to be provocative here to suggest that this was an early attempt at an effects-based approach. All that really means is that the conventional application of overwhelming military force was not a possibility at this period of time. The British were concluding the First World War. They were concerned about this part of the world, but they couldn't send a large conventional expeditionary force there to sort things out. So the tools they relied upon were tools that we nowadays put under the label of the comprehensive approach, attempting to gain political influence in the region, using money to buy allies, and sending small cadres of troops to create forces on the ground from the local nationalities involved. And this was really the origins of Dunster Force, as it came to be called, in the Transcaucasus in 1917, and later on in 1918, Dunster Force's successor, Norper Force. But this is improvised. This is all improvised. Before I move on for this, this point is worth belabouring to some extent. What the British are really tackling here is in some sense a strategic revolution, which is not incomparable to some of the problems that we're trying to get our hands around and handle today. What you see very clearly from 1917 onwards is in Bolshevism a messianic regime which is misunderstood, about which there's a lot of doubt, a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of fear comparable to some degree with some of the things you hear said about Islamic fundamentalist movements today, combined with operating in theatres and regions of the world with which we're previously unfamiliar, compounding that you have the ever-present factor of public opinion. Now, this strategic revolution went on. It didn't stop in 1917. During the interwar period, you see the British trying to adjust to the changed world environment through administrative change. It's no accident that you have a huge amount of administrative change going on in the interwar period. 1923, you've got formation of the Chiefs of Staff Committee. Uh, 1924, Prince of Supply Officers Committee. Joint Planning Committee by 1927. 1936, you've got set up the Joint Intelligence Committee. So there is administrative reform going on across the board in this interwar period, but it all begins, the start of gun for it all, is the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution. What happens in 1917 is that the British have two basic improvised administrative instruments to try and tackle this problem. One is the Eastern Committee under Lord Curzon, which is a remit to look at all problems stretching from an arc between Egypt and British India to try and sort things out in that part of the world because it directly affects British interests. Secondly, you have set up in January 1918 something very unusual in British administrative culture, the combination in one body of strategic intelligence and operational activities, an organisation called MIO, uh, the Military Intelligence Organisation. And MIO is headed by Colonel Richard Steele, and its remit is to look after Russia, Romania, Siberia, Central Asia, the Caucasus, Persia and Afghanistan. Now, the main task of MIO is organising local cadre forces so that this is, does not become eventually a problem for the British themselves. The British cannot afford, at this point in history, to send large conventional forces themselves. So Steele's thinking is that he'll think outside the box. By organising guerrilla activity, by creating proxy armies, he'll effectively prevent the Ottomans and the Germans taking advantage of the Russian collapse and at the same time save the British exchequer. Uh, and the British Army a good deal of effort. So this is an early attempt, I would argue, at effects-based thinking, but it's, it's an attempt that is improvised, that is made under compulsion of contemporary events, and more importantly than that, it rapidly collapses under the momentum of events in the ground itself. The early effort, of course, is to create cadre armies in the ground from the Armenians, the Georgians, and the Azeris to resist the Turks. That effort collapses in 1918 when the Ottomans begin to advance and it's proven that the forces on the ground there simply will not stand up to them. So therefore, Dunster Force becomes from having been 400 officers who were going to train up the armies to fight in that region against the Ottomans. Dunster Force itself becomes the army. We have this change of priority. So Dunster Force goes to Baku to try to fight off the Turks themselves, hoping in the meantime to keep propping up their Azeris to do so in the process. Dunster Force fails to do so, they withdraw from Baku, Baku falls. What then occurs is that you have the end of the First World War, November 1918 by this stage, and the continuation nonetheless of British strategic interest in the Transcaucasus. Dunster Force mutates into Norper Force. They start to establish a Caspian Sea fleet. But again, this is improvised. When they're setting up the Caspian Sea fleet, what they're doing is they're taking 
guns from across the mountain paths of northern Persia, putting them on local light draft commercial vessels and calling that a fleet in being. This is all improvised, on-the-hoof stuff, done very much off the cuff. The British are heavily dependent upon local actors, and this is part of the problem of the effects of base approach in general, is that you have, within coalition operations, multiple people that you're not very certain of. They begin in 1917 by trying to employ Bicharakov, who's an Ossetian Cossack based in northern Persia at the time. He can call upon about a 1,000 men. They try to employ him as a, as a proxy for them. He proves fairly unreliable. He fights outside Baku temporarily and then decides things are getting a bit too hot and moves off further north to Port Petrovsk. More importantly, in that sort of strategic sense, the British do come to try and employ Denikin as a way to fight in the Bolsheviks as a conventional military force in the region. So we're not going to use our army, but we're going to give Denikin tanks, artillery, planes, and hope that he will defeat the nasty Bolsheviks. You have deep, deep internal differences, nonetheless, within the British establishment as to what they're doing in the Transcaucasus and what it is they're trying to achieve. The divisions are widespread, but some of the deepest divisions are between Curzon and Churchill. Lord Curzon, who was on the Eastern Committee at this time and is about to become British Foreign Secretary, is really the only person arguing in the British establishment firmly for a long-term, relatively long-term British presence in the Transcaucasus. Curzon is well-known Russophobe, those of you who know uh, anything about British diplomatic history will be familiar with Curzon, former Viceroy of India, sees Russia as a threat and is very keen to break away bits of the Russian Empire from Russia and to create a barrier between the new Bolshevik state and British India. So this is his concern. He's very much a pro transcaucasus man. He wants to see the Georgians and the Azeris and the Armenians become independent states. But almost nobody else in the British cabinet and the British war office is interested in this plan. It's the end of the First World War. There's no money to do this. The only way to do this is by the, the proxy approach, using the proxy forces on the ground. And that approach disintegrates repeatedly. There are a number of parallels with the present from this period which would be obviously applicable if we ever became involved in this region again. One of the oddities of the situation is that Grozny itself is under siege during this period of time. It goes through not one but two sieges. It's surrounded by trenches and barbed wire. But significantly the Bolsheviks are inside Grozny, not outside trying to get in. This conflict around Grozny is about the mountaineer government trying to establish itself in the region which they fail dramatically to do. A very complicated story, but they fail repeatedly to establish territory or control or leg legitimacy in that region. When the British are in the Transcaucasus in 1919, they become aware of the ethnic differences between the local communities very strongly, and one of the things they have to deal with is the contested territory of Nagorno-Karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan. That's kicking off at this time. The Azeris and Armenians are killing each other, and the British are in the middle trying to serve as peacemakers. You've also got echoes of the present again in what's going on in the North Caucasus. You've got individual Islamists, people who I would call Islamists, like Uzun Haji and Najbuddin Godzinski, calling for the widespread institution of Sharia law. They see the answer to social construction in the region as being imposition of Sharia law, establishment of a unified Islamic state. So there's a lot in this period which repays attention in terms of the present. This is one of my favourite maps. It's a good illustration of how you can try to establish legitimacy by cartography rather than by actual fact. This is a 1930s map of what the former members of the Union, uh, the Mountaineers government, claimed was their territory. They claimed that they had established this terrain, this territory which had been taken away from them by the nasty Bolsheviks. And they even said that, you know, we were so much in control of the territory that we renamed parts of the terrain. So Vladikavkaz and their scheme had, they alleged, been renamed Terakala, and most significantly Petrovsk had been renamed uh, Shamil after Imam Shamil, the 19th century resistance fighter. This was a map produced in the 1930s for political effect. It was produced by the diaspora to try and gain support for their cause. What's significant about studying the region at the time, 1917 to 1920 period, is that this is pure fantasy. This territory never actually existed as a, as a state at any period of time, as a unified state defending its borders. The members of the body proclaiming this state had sought support from a variety of organizations and interested parties. They'd gone first to the Turks, and then when the Turks had lost the war, they turned to the British. But the most significant fact of the whole process was that they never had enough support themselves. They always needed an outside partner.
Now, the British policy, as I've already implied, was deeply confused. Towards Dunican in the north, they wanted to support him to fight the nasty Bolsheviks and crush them and kill the Bolshevik baby at birth. But there was also this fear that Dunican himself was basically a Russian imperialist. Dunican's plans were not simply to defeat the Bolsheviks, but to reconquer the Transcaucasus as well. You had an ambiguous policy towards the Mountaineer Republic, what I've called non-benign neglect, the policy of not caring very much about them. Being involved with them, they sent liaison officers to the Mountaineer government. They corresponded with the politicians within the Mountaineer government, but they weren't actually interested in supporting them against Dunican. When Dunican started to invade the territory and annex parts of the Mountaineer Republic, it simply folded up like a deck of cards, because the British weren't actually interested in getting involved. And Azerbaijan, Georgia and Armenia, what I've called a combination of contempt and economic exploitation. The complexities of this were summed up by Kirsten himself. Kirsten, remember, is the most pro-intervention policymaker within the British cabinet. He's the person arguing that the British need to be here, need to get involved and need to stabilise this region. But he himself sums up the policy like this, as he sees it. A. We are pro Dunican north of the Caucasus. B. We are anti Dunican south of the Caucasus. C. We are pro Georgia insofar as she is respectable and orderly. D. We are anti Georgian insofar that she is Bolshevik and violent. E. We are pro Armenia insofar that we do not want to see them exterminated. F. We are anti Armenia insofar as we do not mean to assume the responsibility either of supplying them with arms or of guaranteeing an Armenian state. G. Whether we are pro-Azerbaijan or anti-Azerbaijan, I have not the least idea. H. As to the hill state, he means the mountaineer government, I suppose it is little more than a various group of bandits who are smashed by Dunican when his troops are in the neighbourhood and who smash him when they are elsewhere employed. So this is the most pro-interventionist member of the British cabinet, a person who believes that Britain needs to be involved here, summing up the confusion of British policy in the region. Now there are plenty of other people who are much more cynical. This is General Millen, who's commander of the British forces in the Black Sea. So the theatre commander in the modern sense, summing up how he sees the region. Now the consequences of this policy is that through the summer of 1919, you have more and more voices calling for a British withdrawal from the Caucasus. And they try and find various ways to escape this with honour. One policy under discussion is that the Trans-Caucasus will be mandated, will give it to Italy. The Italians can sort it out. Another policy is that Armenia will become a mandated territory for America. The Americans will sort it out. None of this comes to pass. Nobody really wants the Trans-Caucasus in this period of time, despite the obvious interest in oil which were emerging even then. In concluding this, I just want to touch very briefly on the Bolshevik aspect of this, because obviously what I've been doing is looking on the one side at the British records and the British accounts, and on the other hand looking at the Russian records and Russian accounts on this. And one of the things I've been using recently, which has been of interest to me, has been the papers of Sergei Kirov and Orjana Kidsey, who were the major Bolshevik actors in the Caucasus. And microfilm of their personal papers are in Glasgow Universal Library. Now, do the Bolsheviks have an effects-based approach? Are they more effective than the British? Well, in some ways I want to argue that in many respects they are. They have a clear end state in mind, and I think that's probably the most important factor in this overall equation. The British don't really know what the end state is to be. They don't know what they're trying to achieve, how they want the outcome in that region to emerge. The Bolsheviks have a very clear end state in mind. They want to conquer as much territory as possible, and they're willing to be very tactically flexible to do that. And one of the, the people who's most flexible in that regard is Kirov himself. Kirov is a master at making tactical alliances with local political parties in the Caucasus and Transcaucasus. So you have the Bolsheviks on the scene, and they have local knowledge, they have the inside knowledge. You've got N.F. Kikalo, who's a Chechen, pro-Bolshevik, operating in Grozny around uh, this time. Orjana Kitsi himself, a Georgian, very familiar with the Georgian situation, friends with many Georgian Mensheviks. Actually an object of suspicion amongst Russian Bolsheviks, because he was so pro-Georgian in some respects. Kirov himself, a Russian, but a Russian who had lived in the region for over a decade before 1917. And the Bolshevik strategy is really orientated around a careful combination of conventional military force in the north, keeping Dnikin at bay, and political subversion. One of the interesting aspects in the papers, in Kirov and Orchard and Kids' papers, is the way they went about this. 
The Bolsheviks made numerous mistakes over the course of 1918. They lost power in the Terek region because they tried to disempower the Terek Cossack host. The Cossacks went into revolt and the Bolsheviks were thrown out of office. But what they are doing from 1919 onwards is funding the guerrilla movement against the Nikon in the Caucasus region, in the North Caucasus. And the way they're doing this is very interesting. A lot of the policies carried out by couriers. They send couriers armed with money to feed the mountaineers with sufficient money that they'll keep fighting Dnikin. And the plan is, obviously, that Dnikin will be so occupied with fighting the mountaineers in his rear that his conventional force in the north will gradually be weakened facing the Bolsheviks and Dnikin will thus be defeated. But what I want to do is to look at how this was done. One of the things that Dnikin had against him was that his own policies in the region were guaranteed to alienate almost everybody involved. Dnikin, when he started to get involved in the Caucasus, particularly to attack the mountaineer government, did so with a very aggressive policies. He went into the Caucasus basically with the view that this is a region that was fit to be reconquered. One of the most infamous acts he carried out was when he was repressing the Ossetian Kermanists. Kermen was a local revolutionary party which was associated with the Bolsheviks, later amalgamated with the Bolsheviks. But Denikin's idea of capturing Kermanists was to surround a village with conventional military force and ask them to hand over the Kermanists amongst them. When the village refused to do so, the village was then bombarded with about 50 artillery shells from both sides. The villagers then surrendered. They were then robbed by Denikin's Cossacks and sent off in the cold and the rain to starve to death, and the property was divided up amongst the White Army. So Denikin's policies in the Caucasus this is the British ally. The Nikon's policies in the Caucasus create a lot of resentment against him and against his forces. And the Bolsheviks naturally exploit this. The Bolshevik policy is based around money. And this, again, is the effects-based approach. What they are doing is they are sending couriers via the Caspian Sea through Azerbaijan, through Georgia, into the Caucasus region to feed the mountaineers with money. And there's significant amounts of money being involved here. A lot of Kirov's telegrams, his personal communications, are concerned with the money and the fate of these couriers. He asks constantly about, have you got the five million rubles I sent you yet? I'm sending you somebody else as well. He's got three million rubles. So a lot of Kirov's personal correspondence with the local revolutionaries is about ensuring that the money is going to the right places and that the insurgency is carrying on. Secondly, these couriers who are operating for the Bolsheviks are, to some significant degree as well, intelligence agents. They're gathering intelligence on the region uh, and feeding it back to the 11th Army, the Bolshevik 11th Army around Astrakhan. Some of this information, you have to treat it with caution because obviously these people are communists. They're obviously not great friends of the British. But I think it's significant what they're saying because when they're looking at the Transcaucasus, they're saying that basically this region is up for grabs. The British are not in control. The British are not interested, they're not in control. We can move freely in this region, and we can certainly shift money about in this region. This is not going to be a problem for us. For example, you've got the report of Comrade Gabinsky. Gabinsky was sent through the Transcaucasus to give money to the mountaineers fighting Dnikin. And he commented, passing through Baku, that the British, through lack of interpreters, weren't censoring the press. It was free fire zone as far as the media was concerned. Because of the difficulty of finding interpreters, all the British were concerned of in terms of censorship was looking at articles which had the word England in it. They looked for that one word. If the article mentioned England, then the article was put under scrutiny and could be censored. But as long as you didn't mention England, you could say anything you liked in the local press. And from the Bolshevik point of view, of course, this was a great thing. This was a complete free-for-all. Secondly, the Bolshevik perception was, and I think this is significant, that the British garrisons and the British forces in the region were extremely low in morale. They basically wanted to go home. Gabinsky went to Batum, which is in uh, Georgia at that time, and he said that he had conversed in the port of Batum with um, local British soldiers. Now, again, you have to treat this cautiously, but it's always interesting, as Rory Burns said, to see us as others see us, to see yourself as others see you. Gabinsky's report, and this is going back to the Bolshevik High Command, said the soldiers, the ordinary British soldier, views Bolshevism more favourably than Dnikin. Through sign language, the soldiers communicated to Gabinsky that they would like to have Dnikin shot and that they really didn't care about the region at all. Some mimic with their hands, he says, that Bolshevism is good and Dnikin should be shot. Another aspect of his report, this is again an intelligence report which is feeding Bolshevik strategy. It may not be 100% representative, but this is what their actors are saying on the ground. He says, it's characteristic that English soldiers are terribly cowardly 
discipline has visibly fallen down. A single shot in the night turns them all out on alert. All demand to be sent home as soon as possible. So the Bolsheviks are getting a very clear picture from their intelligence couriers that the British in the region are not there to stay. That's the picture they're getting, and they're, they're getting ready to act on that. Simultaneously, they're getting pictures from the Caucasus that Uzun Haji, their ally at the time, is doing very well at fighting against Nikon, and really all is needed is money. Gordienko goes to Ossetia to visit Gikalo, who's leading the Bolshevik campaign there alongside Haji at that point in time. Gakalo's men are in rags. Gordienko is very explicit about this in his report. He says that outwardly the situation is not good. Gakalo and his men are in the hills. They're equipped with rifles. They've got about 13 machine guns and they've got one mortar as artillery. And they're in rags. They're starving to death. So outwardly this didn't look like a good picture. But Gakalo himself is very confident. He says the only thing that you need is money. He says... If I had 900 to 100 million rubles, then I could organize enough forces and I can wipe out the volunteer army, the whites, in two months. So that picture there as well, all the insurgency needs is that you feed enough money into it and actually we'll win. And I think that affects the Bolshevik policy as a whole. The Bolsheviks are ultimately successful not because they succeed in conquering the Caucasus north to south entirely with conventional military force, but because they succeed in bringing temporarily insurgents over to their side, bypassing Chechnya and Dagestan, which are the problem areas in many ways, and then conventionally marching through Azerbaijan, Armenia, and eventually Georgia with conventional military power. So... Looking at it from the point of view of the contemporary effects-based approach, the, the Bolsheviks have a very clear effects-based approach and they carry it out very successfully, despite tactical mistakes they make on the ground from time to time. On that point, I'd like to draw to a close and sort of invite questions. I'm aware that this has probably been an enormous brain dump and there's a lot involved. It's a very, very complicated and complex period and I'm happy to sort of try and clarify any questions you may have. The following 12 questions were put to Dr Marshall. Question 1. Can you say more about the extent to which Kirsten's interest in the defence of India influenced the British approach to the Caucasus and British actions? Those who were members of the Indian establishment, like Curzon, saw the Caucasus in this way. Thompson, for example, when he goes into Baku, begins by saying his first speech is that we are pro Danique and we want to see Russia get back on our feet again. Within a month of that public announcement, he's writing back to his superiors in London that actually the people in this region don't like the Russians. We should be thinking of taking this region over for ourselves. So those who come from the Indian establishment have a long track record of this kind of thing, if you like. And they are sufficiently anti-Russian that they're not interested in seeing, not interested in seeing the Bolsheviks win, but they're not particularly keen in seeing Danikin win either. They are, of all the British establishment, those most keen to see the establishment of independent states. But they are outvoted within the British cabinet and uh, decision-making circles as a whole. Curzon loses this argument. Question two. Is Thompson basically making his observations on the hoof, saying, hey, there's a vacuum here, let's take advantage of it, and feeding it back to London? He is under the guise of, I'm the man in the spot, I know. I know the local people. Now, in fact, he... There's little evidence to say he, he knows the local people at all, but he is manipulating his position to say, hey, I'm on the ground, I know what these people really want. They don't want the Russians at all. They need a firm hand, they need a bit of benign empire, and we should be thinking about doing it. Question three. Do you think the British intervention into Turkestan, as well as the Transcaucasus, was India-centric? It is India-driven, but there's a variety of interests going on here. I mean, I think it is India-driven to some extent, but there's also the British interest in Persia at this time, which cannot be underestimated either, and the desire to see Persia fall more under the British sphere of influence rather than have the old division from the 1907 agreement to have Persia fall completely into the British sphere of influence is very desirable from the, from the British perspective. Question four. At what point did we pull the plug on all this? I should have emphasised that. Summer of 1919, they began pulling out the conventional forces entirely. The last British garrison there is in Batum, and it goes in 1920. But it's very much the sort of last post type thing. It's a very small force on the ground just to garrison Batum itself, and it pulls out in 1920. But in terms of the Transcaucasus Railway guarding and garrisoning, that, that's going by the end of 1919. The decision, strategic decision, has been made. Question five. To what extent is it tied up with the Middle East policy problems? 
I think as far as Curzon is concerned, it's directly tied up with it, only in the sense that Curzon himself is uh, a fantastically vain man. I mean, the famous rhyme, my name is George Nathaniel Curzon, I am a very superior person. Curzon regards himself as a specialist. He's, he's travelled through Central Asia, he's been in India, he's travelled through the Caucasus and Persia. He feels that nobody's paying attention to him. He's really is a person who knows. People should be listening to him and just letting him get on with it. And when Curzon is heading into position of taking over the Foreign Office, he's very much of the view that he has been cut out from the diplomacy. He's been cut out from the Balfour Declaration. He's been cut out from the European settlement. And his chance to shine is really the Transcaucasus. Curzon at this point in time, it's not apparent to Curzon that his political career is essentially over. That would become apparent after the fact. Curzon is angling, I think, in this period to eventually become British Prime Minister. That's how he sees it. And he sees the Transcaucasus as a magnificent stepping stone, if it was a success. I think he honestly saw it as a stepping stone to advance his own interests. But as I say, he failed to convince MD else of this. Question six. Do you think the British policy-making process actually understands the difference between Russian and Bolshevik? One of the other parallels you can make is that the British in this period do not have a firm understanding of what Bolshevism is. For at least the first three years, from 1917, arguably to 1920 even, they regard Bolshevism primarily as simply a German-Jewish conspiracy, something that has simply been cooked up by the Germans. Nothing indigenous to it at all, no real uh, hard-line support, no sane person would support Bolshevism. And their approach to the question of Bolshevism and the challenge it poses goes through that lens for quite a bit of time until, obviously, Bolshevism itself starts to establish firmer roots and that takes on its own identity. So this perception that it was simply a conspiracy that would fall like a house of cards, I think, fed British overconfidence in general. Question seven. Following on from the last question, do you end up with those people who know things about Russia being seen as experts, when really they know nothing, because you really need to know about Bolsheviks, not Russians? I think there's a certain degree of truth in that. There's also the, the lack of understanding that this is a revolution itself and the characteristics of revolution and the implications that it brings. I mean, there's not the understanding of why Bolshevism would appeal. Why would it gather support? How would it operate? Would it operate in a conventional sense and it can be tackled conventionally? I mean, they are groping towards that. I mean, one of the thing, interesting things that comes up in the discussions in 1919, somebody very bright spark says the best way to keep Bolshevism out of Transcaucasus is the economic line of operation. You make the region economically prosperous and Bolshevism will not get a foothold. But there's not the sort of joined up government then, if there's joined up government today, who knows, but there's certainly not a joined up government then to try and implement that kind of policy, despite having had the idea, which is a good idea. They have no idea at that time. This is, this is a new strategic revolution that's occurred. They are groping towards an answer towards it. In the interwar period, you have this very interesting time, as I said already, you have all these new committees set up, the most notable as far as Bolshevism being concerned, being the Committee to Handle Eastern Unrest. These committees are created very much from the perception that there has been a strategic revolution and we've got to change. But in 1917, 1920, this is just in its early stages. It's been done on the hoof. It's an improvised process. Question 8. Wouldn't our experience in the north around Archangel have started to educate the system to the differences between Bolsheviks and Russians? The various British missions are completely isolated from each other. I mean, there's very little communication between them. Again, communications in general in this period are not what they are today. I mean, Bailey in Turkestan, for example, is very much his own man. He goes from Kashgari into Turkestan and he's given strategic aims. We'd like you to do this. And then he's left himself to do it. And that really sums up a lot of British interventions in this period as a whole. It's the men in the spot who are left holding the the basket. Question 9. Lloyd George was not all that fired up with the idea of fighting Bolshevism, and by the early 20s was leaning towards the idea of a rapprochement with them. What effect did that have on the overall process? As soon as Lloyd George put his weight into the arguments that were going on within the British establishment as a whole, Curzon lost. I think that sums up the position as a whole fairly well. It's not necessarily a comprehensive judgment, but Lloyd George does bear a significant degree of responsibility for the change, the switch in policy and the uncertainty in policy as a whole. I mean, we talked about this when Keith Nielsen was here giving his lectures. I mean, there is a clique within the British establishment, a liberal wing, who regard the Bolsheviks as human being. It's a very unsettled time, but eventually we can sit around a table and talk to these people and we should not be making war on them aspects of the press in Britain, like the Manchester Guardian and things like that, saying very strongly, very loud and very clearly that we should not be helping people like Dunikin. The revolution in Russia is a good thing. 
So you've got public opinion there as well, pushing the issue. Question 10. Have you come across anything that highlights the links, if there are any, between Arab nationalism and certain Muslim policies? I haven't found direct links between Arab nationalism and what's going on in the Transcaucasus, but what is very interesting and evident is the intellectual exchange that is going on in one direction between Turkey and the Caucasus in this period of time, and in the other direction between Azerbaijan, as I've said, implied already, and Iran. And you've got the emergence in the 20th century of a leftist movement in Iran, basically from this period of time, from revolutionaries acting on both sides of the border from 1905 onwards, finding refuge in Russian territory, getting involved in the Iranian Revolution in the 1900s, then moving back when things get hot across the border again. So you've got, I wouldn't say, a direct link between the sort of Arab nationalism and Arab ideology and Bolshevism at this time, but certainly between Turkey and between Iran. One of the characters I'm interested in, I'm trying to investigate in the book, is a chap called Korkmasov, Jelamuddin or Korkmasov, who's in Dagestan. And he doesn't become a Bolshevik until 1918. He's a late convert, which is why he's later killed off in the 30s, because everybody who's a late convert is an object of suspicion. Everybody who knew Lenin is an object of suspicion. But if you were late in the Civil War and joining the Bolshevik side later on, that was clearly you for the chop as well. But Kurt Masser, before 1917, where is he? He's in Turkey, writing for the only Ottoman socialist newspaper that was being printed at that time. He's a good friend of Subi, who's leader of the Turkish Communist Party, he gets bumped off by Ataturk eventually in 1920, I believe. So he's in Turkey and he's in Paris, he's in the Sorbonne, that home of the Asian revolutionary in the 20th century. So he, he is getting a very good Western education and he's getting a very good trans-border inculcation into the events in Turkey and the Caucasus at the same time. So you've got these interesting characters who do this kind of cross the borders, who do not fit neatly into the box of Bolshevik or Menshevik. They're ambiguous figures. Question 11. Am I right in thinking that Britain wasn't fighting for Christianity against Muslim because there was no consciousness that Russians were Christians and the bad guys were either Muslims or atheists? No, it wasn't a factor. This was not a clash of civilizations. It was much more complicated than that. It's a very complicated period. I mean, one of, the, one of the aspects of it that's coming out is that you have the emerging of national consciousness. Certainly in Azerbaijan, you have what is a very nascent national consciousness. And the, the signs of that are the use of the word millet, which in the Ottoman Empire was simply a protected community, but by the early 20th century had come to be accepted as a term that you could apply to a nation. So you have in Dagestan the millet committee, which is the national committee. And that is regarded as a committee that is going to defend national interests. See, this idea that the idea of the nation exists, we are a nation, rather than simply a bunch of tribes. And that is beginning to emerge. And the Bolsheviks, of course, reinforce that aspect when they later go in for nation building in the Caucasus themselves. Question 12. Was a lot of your source material original language based? Russian and English language based, I mean, the sort of English memoirs themselves are fairly fascinating because they give you an insight into all the kind of prejudices. The people on the ground, I mean, people like Dunsterville, when you read their memoirs, what strikes you most of all is just how incredibly small-minded these people are. These are not people of broad horizons who can, you know, create strategic policy on a broad scope. A lot of them have been promoted above their natural position in life. Mallison's the same. Mallison goes in for a fantastic boasting after the war is over about the enormous intelligence network he set up and how he knew what the Bolsheviks were doing and if he'd just been given a chance he would have crushed them. But I don't think it stands up from an English memoir accounts and the PRO literature. A lot of these people are significantly out of their depth. And that goes back to the point Greg was raising about the difference between Russianists, even people who speak Russian, and people who understand Bolshevism and what a revolution actually means. Even the Russianists don't fully appreciate, understand how much the situation has changed. Dunstaville speaks Russian. He thinks that qualifies him to go to Baku and sort things out because he knows Russia. But he doesn't understand what a revolution does, what the main characteristics of a revolution are, and how you have to operate in that environment. Dr. Alex Marshall can be contacted by email at amarshall.jscsc at da.mod.uk.